and we're back. This is Eric, the Big Fishmonger, and welcome to the Lounge Pokemon Draft League Season 1 Battle Breakdown, a series where we briefly dissect and discuss the battles from each week, featuring and pointing out any highlights, upsets, or major plays made during those games. Today I'll be breaking down the heated battle between Ben on the left and Jake on the right. For a little context going into this game, Jake currently sits on the top of our leaderboard with an undefeated record, while Ben is more of the underdog here, with no games under his belt yet this season. So there's a lot on the line here for both players. Um, also, the move Shedtail was recently banned to Ubers, making Ben's Orthorm far less threatening than it used to be, so it may be, wise to, uh, may be a wise decision for him to trade that out uh, sometime in the near future, but for now he's decided to keep it, so let's see where that goes. Um, yeah, let's get into the game. So, turn one, we see Clodsire versus Lorantis, and it is revealed that Clodsire is holding the Air Balloon. Now, that might be, that's a little bit of a weird decision to make. Um, I mean, there could be any number of reasons. Clodsire is weak to the ground type. Um, so it might have been fearing uh, Tyranitar lead. Jake has led his past two games with Tyranitar. So maybe he was anticipating that and wanting to just put some pressure on Tyranitar early on um, with the air balloon. I feel like uh, another item probably would have been a bit more useful here, especially seeing how Clodsire is pretty bulky. So even an earthquake from Tyranitar probably wouldn't have done much damage to him, and he could have just invested uh, his stats a bit differently to avoid that situation. So, you know, already off to an interesting start here. Um, the Clodsire is a pretty bulky, specially defensive Pokemon, so in, in the face of Lorantis, it, it's probably not that scared despite, um, despite Lorantis being kind of scary. So Lorantis starts up with a Leaf Storm and boosts its uh, special attack here, and we see Leaf Storm healing 41%. Now, um, an unboosted Leaf Storm from a max special attack Lorantis should only deal a maximum of about 31% to a full HP, full special defense Clodsire, but we see 41% here. So, uh, this indicates that Clodsire is probably not invested in special defense at all, and might actually be more, um, attack oriented, which would be really interesting to see. You don't get to see that kind of, uh, set running on Clodsires very often. Um, Popping the balloon, so it was a cool item, but ultimately didn't really get to do much this game. Bit of a bummer to see that. Uh, Clodsire goes for Toxic Spikes on this first turn. Maybe he was thinking um, Lorantis would switch out here, uh, fearing the poison type from Clodsire. But Clodsire is kind of known to just sit there and take hits, so Jake probably didn't feel pressure to switch out here. Um, the toxic Spikes get to go up. Jake does have the poison type Iron Moth on the back to scoop up these spikes later in the game. So, interesting first turn play here, maybe not the best um, on Ben's side, probably hoping for a switch out, but, I mean, Spikes on the field does pressure Jake into switching into his Moth before anything else, so, I can't say it's the worst decision to make, but, um, we'll see how that plays out for him. So, Zoranthus goes for another Leaf Storm, thanks to Clodsire's unaware ability, it, um, is able to survive. This uh, two times boosted Leaf Storm from a uh, two times boosted Stab Leaf Storm from Lorantis. Um, probably a max special attack Lorantis. This is a very hard hitting Pokemon, especially after it's boosted. So Clodsire's ability to just sit here and take these neutral hits, especially if it's not um, invested in special defense, um, it's very impressive. Uh, and special attack keeps going up, but then Clodsire goes for Poison Jab. 81% to Lorantis. Had he just started off first turn with Poison Jab, Lorantis might not even be standing here right now. So, go for the Toxic Spikes lead, it, you know, it works, but unfortunately Lorantis is able to finish off Clodsire here uh, with the Giga Drain, opting to get back a little bit more health recovery with his leftovers of Giga Drain, instead of going for the um, extra boost with one more Leaf Storm. You know, you could really go either way here. I guess Jake values keeping his Lorantis healthy more than the potential damage output it could deal. Um, Ben's team is pretty weak to the grass type in general, so I'd say that was a pretty good play, but we'll see how that works out for him too. Um, so in comes Orkworm, a... Oh, how's that? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I'm sure you saw that, but yeah. Wolfram comes in. It's the only Pokemon Ben has that can reasonably take a plus three, or a plus four um, Leaf Storm from Lorantis. Everything else is either weak to it or just uh, doesn't resist the hit. Orphorm is the only thing Ben has that can handle this attack. And even then, um, we see a hit, and Orphorm takes 83%. Um, that confirms that this must be especially defensive Orphorm, uh, unless for some reason Jake's not running a fully attack-invested Lorantis too, which I guess could be an option. But it means this is a very bulky Orphorm that was probably built around taking these strong special hits. Um, and even with the resisted Leaf Storm, that's still the 83%, which is crazy. Um, a resisted plus four Leaf Storm can still one-hit knockout. Um, any non-specially invested orc worms. So, Jake probably wanted to get some HP back between turns with that Giga Drain, make his, uh, keep, keep his Lorantis healthy, but had he just gone for another Leaf Storm to finish off Cloud Sire, Orc Worm would still be sitting here right now, which is terrifying to think about. Jake could have had this whole game in the bag right off the bat. <laughs> um, had he um, maybe just gone for another Leaf Storm. So, Orthworm is able to get a body press off here. It only does 33%. Now, body press is an interesting choice here. It's not stab boosted or anything. Um, and if this is a specially defensive Orthworm, then that means body press, you know, it's strong, but probably not going to be able to knock out Lorenzo's anyways. So, well, Orthworm did take a hit and survive the um, boosted Leaf Storm. All it really did was put Lorantis into a bit of a lower range before um, getting finished off by another Giga Drain, letting Lorantis heal up a little bit more with leftovers. It's almost back to where it started um, after knocking out Cloud Sire at 34%. So, Orthworm did a little bit of damage here, but Lorantis is still pretty healthy, and now it's at plus six special attack. That's terrifying. Um,. So, yeah, no Benson's in his Tauros. Uh, Tauros can outspeed Lorantis. It's the only thing left on Ben's team that has any reasonable chance of dealing with Lorantis here. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's his last option to try to make any progress here. Um, Jake goes for Protect, I guess, trying to squeeze out any last little bit of leftovers recovery he can get. Um, but ultimately, that didn't really matter, because... Here we see a terrifying close combat. Um, even without the terrifying close combat would have shredded Lorantis apart here. So it's interesting to see the Terra type here. I don't really know what that was trying to predict. Maybe he just wanted to make sure that he would knock out Lorantis here. Um, seeing how it would sweep through the rest of his team if Taurus didn't get the kill. So I guess he's just going for the um just guaranteeing his knock knockout on this turn. So it's a good thing that Lorantis didn't, um, like, tear a ghost here. Um, that would have really shut down the rest of Ben's team pretty hard. So, Taurus does knock out the Lorantis. Um, and then in comes Iron Moth, immediately picking up those, uh, Toxic Spikes. So, those don't really get to play much of a role in this game. Um, and we also get to see, uh, Booster Energy, which uh, activates the Pork Drive Speed Boost. Iron Moth is now the fastest thing in the game uh, with both that both players have right now. So, Taurus is scary, and Taurus is fast, but Iron Moth is even faster. So, with those uh, lower defenses, Taurus does not like to be um, facing down this Iron Moth right now. Ben knows that, so he switches into a Slow King, and t beautifully takes a Psychic from Iron Moth. Um... That was a good prediction on Ben's part, not wanting to risk losing his Tauros here. Um, and switching in a very bulky, especially defensive Pokemon. Um, I don't know if he was necessarily predicting the uh, Psychic. Um, that's not really... that's that's a relatively common move on Iron Moth, but... Maybe he thought it was going to be a Fighter-type attack, in which case Slowking still would have worked just fine here. So this was a, this was a great switch. Um... Although Iron Moth is pretty scary, and it is still extremely fast, so Ben's got to do something about this quick. 
Um, Iron Moth uh, goes to the Terra Grass into the Energy Ball. 75% to Slowking. I mean, that just goes to show both how strong Iron Moth is, but also how bulky Slowking is. That is able to just stand there and face tank a stab energy ball. Um, uh, just like that. So, how does Ben capitalize on this extra turn he gets with Slowking? Trick room. So, this makes, uh, this makes Iron Moth now the slowest thing both players have, which is a uh, pretty big deal. Because now this gives Ben an opportunity to attack a Slow King and give his other team members a chance to play the game a bit more. So, that was a pretty good play on Ben's part. It gives him some momentum and kind of makes uh, Iron Moth a bit of a liability for Jake. So, and anyway, something I wanted to bring up was, um, assuming that, that Iron Moth was fully invested in special attack, and Slow King was fully invested in special defense, um, Energy Ball could never knock out Slow King there without a critical hit. So, I mean, unless he got the crit, unless he got the lucky crit, Ben really wasn't at any risk here um, of not getting his Trick Room up, which I'd say was a good sign. You know, this wasn't some lucky roll that he survived. It was just Slow King being a, a special tank. Um... So, as you probably saw before, Sloping got an Ice Beam in, and that deal dealt 56% to the Iron Moth. Now, you know, I can only speculate on this as being used here, but assuming Moth isn't invested in this defense, um, in its defense stats, uh, Ice Beam from a def specially defensive Sloping should never really deal as much damage. There's a good chance that this is a somewhat offense-oriented Sloping, or this was a low damage roll from Energy Ball, or something. But, um, that was a pretty good chunk of damage dealt to Iron Moth there. Um, so I guess it just goes to show Sloking, you know, can take hits, but it can also dish back hits pretty hard, too. Also, for a little bit of a behind-the-scenes context here, um, on this past turn, um, so... <laughs> so before this game... Um, ben and I were doing some practice games uh, using our own teams, and I got frozen by Ice Beam twice in the same game. So, at this moment, I think everybody was kind of thinking that RNG would kind of come in to save Ben here and get the 10% um, freeze on Iron Moth. As you guys can see, that didn't happen, but it would have been really funny if it did. Uh, Part of me kind of hope, it, kind of wishes it did. Even though I, I hate freeze, I think it's such an annoying mechanic. But it would have been really funny. Anyways, Energy Ball does finish it off. Uh, Slow King, and Ben switches into Greedent. So thanks to Trick Room, uh, Greedent is faster than Iron Moth here. But um, he's only got three turns left, so he's got to make the most of it as he can. Um. So, despite going first, thanks to his Trick Room, his Body Press only deals 32. It doesn't even knock out Iron Moth. Um, now, Body Press was an interesting decision here. Um, it did a bit more damage than what would usually be expected. Um, but, so, maybe maybe this is a slightly attack-invested Greedent, who, who really knows. But, a normal type move like Body Slam definitely would have knocked out Iron Moth here. So it's an interesting choice to have used um, Body Press here. The only reason I could see Body Press really being used would be if maybe Ben was predicting a Tyranitar switch in, which, I mean, that would have been super hype if it happened, but Jake's not really been showing himself to be much of a um, switcher, I guess, this game. So going for the... Um, the hard predict on a Tyranitar switch in might not have been the best choice here. I mean, even if Tyranitar did switch in and get hit with a body slam, I mean, worst case scenario, it gets paralyzed, maybe is slower than Greedent now, but it's not going to be able to knock out Greedent in one turn, so Greedent could still get him another body press off. Um, or, or maybe Jake would have just switched to Dragapult, because that would be both body press and 
Ultimate Body Slam. So, I think just going for a Body Slam or any other normal type move on this turn probably would have been better, because it would have just guaranteed the knockout on Iron Moth. But, I am a fan of predictions. I do think predictions are fun. So, maybe if, uh, if Ben was predicting a Tyranitar switch in here, that would have, uh, that would have worked out pretty, pretty well in his favor. But unfortunately, takes 43% from an energy ball. Um, you know, green is pretty bulky, but I don't think any Pokemon will, uh, likes to take that much damage, especially if they could have gone for the kill on that turn. It also loses him another, one more turn Trick Room, and he can't set that back up, so he's got to make the most of it as he can. Um, he goes for Crunch here, which does finish off the uh, Iron Moth. Um, you know, I guess he's just going for Covered Goose at this point. That, I guess, uh, Crunch would have covered a Dragapult switch in. Um, not sure why Jake would have switched into Dragapult. Maybe Green's not even using any normal type moves. Who, who really knows? But, um, he does get the knockout on Iron Moth, so, um, ultimately making a little bit of progress here with Green, which is always fun to see from a PU Pokemon beating a uh, top OU threat. So, in comes Tatsugiri, which, um, despite its appearance, can actually be a pretty, uh, pretty scary special attacker. Um, but luckily Ben still does have one more turn of Flip Room, so let's see where he goes with this. So we see the Stuff Cheeks plus Ganlon Berry plus Cheek Pouch, uh, strategy. Um, this is actually something I told Ben about ahead of time. Um, so I was really hoping I'd get to see it at some point. Now, defense doesn't really help against Tatsugiri that much, because it is a special attacker. Maybe Ben didn't know this, but getting that plus three defense is pretty huge for Greedip, especially if we know it has body press. So, that's a pretty exciting turn to see. It also, um, does allow Greedip to heal back up almost to full, so it does let Greedip last a bit longer too, which is, um, Definitely good to see. Tatsugiri goes for the Rapid Spin, uh, boosting its speed. Now Tatsugiri is faster than Tauros. Um, unless Tauros, maybe maybe it's Scarf, we don't quite know that yet. Probably isn't Scarf. Um, but yeah, now Tatsugiri is the fastest thing in the field. Um, out and outside of Trick Room, uh, that's pretty scary to see. So, I guess going for that one turn boost, maybe just looking for the long game, wanting to let Tatsugiri last as long as it can, instead of just going for outright damage. Uh, income Surf, 45%. We didn't, you know, barely put into KO range here. Um, kinda, kinda, kinda scary to see from a, uh, Hatsugiri. It, it always hits way harder than you think. But, um, this was a bit strange. Ben chose to use Crunch here. Yeah, so, the only reason I could see Ben going for Crunch here was on the off chance that Jake recognized the defense boost on Greedit was a, was a threat with body press and wanted to avoid the body press by switching to Dragapult, uh, in which case Ben would have predicted that and dealt a pretty good chunk of damage to his Dragapult with Crunch. Um, definitely not knocked it out, but uh, maybe just going for um, a little bit of chip damage on the switch. Um, I feel like if that was the decision Ben was going for, then he's playing a little bit too prediction reliant. I like predictions, but it should be every turn. It should be, you know, when you kind of pressure your opponent to switch out. Um, Jake probably wasn't feeling very pressured here. Um, although a plus three boosted max special defense green at body press can one hit KO most uh, Tatsukiri sets. So, um, it wouldn't be unreasonable. Um, for Ben to just go for the knockout here, um, or maybe if Jake knew that his Tatsugiri could survive a plus three body press, um, then he would have tried going to Dragapult, but this uh, very prediction-reliant game isn't really working out for Ben because, you know, Tatsugiri gets a little bit of life over recovery, er, no, uh, leftover recovery, and then knocks out Green with Surf on the next turn. So now we've got a fast, um, pretty healthy Tatsugiri on the field that um, outspeeds everything else she could throw at it. So, not a good situation to be in. So, 
then switches back into Tauros. Um, Tauros is no longer water type, so I don't know that makes a big difference um, against like dragon attacks, but that does mean Surf is not resisted anymore, so it is an option for Katsugiri to use if you want something a bit more um, reliable. Um, however, Katsugiri gets the 10% miss on Draco Meteor. I mean, Ben's been getting kind of unlucky this game, so that, that was uh, that was huge. Um, depending on the Tatsuki reset, Draco Meteor has a chance to one-hit KO um, Oros too. It's just that strong coming off Tatsuki. So, you know, again, I don't know what sets these players are running. We haven't really gotten to see a whole lot, so I can't say exactly for sure if that would have been able to knock out Oros, and it definitely would have been up to a damage roll, but avoiding it outright versus taking most of your HP or even getting knocked out, that's a huge, um, huge game changer for uh, Ben right there. So, um, and, and that gives him the chance to go for his Terra Blast, Terra Fighting Terra Blast. Um, it's not something you see too often, I mean, especially with something that's like a fast hard hitter like Tauros, you usually just see only close combat, but Terra Blast is fun to see, it's it's reliant, it's got good damage, um, doesn't lower his defenses, and ultimately did knock out Tatsugiri, so can't say it was a bad turn. Um, so Tatsugiri faints, and in comes Sylveon. Sylveon is a fairy type, as you all know, and there's not much for Tauros to do here. Um, it has some water type attacks, but without any boosts, it's not going to be able to knock out Sylveon in one turn here. And Sylveon is a very scary um, special attacker with that pixelate hyper voice. So Ben does the only thing he, um, the only choice he really has here uh, for to secure endgame, and he goes to Mudsdale. Now Mudsdale is known for being a, having its physical bulk. Um, however, it is able to tank these hyper voices. Um, and based on these damages, it's, uh, it's gonna still take three Hyper Voices to knock out this Mudsdale, so it will be able to make a little bit of progress here. And, um, it does the best it can with a Heavy Slam, dealing 66% to that Sylveon. You know, I'd, unless this was maybe a Choice Band Mudsdale, it, it, there was no way it was gonna be able to knock out a Sylveon here. But getting in such a big chunk of damage in, that does mean uh, Tauros should be able to finish it off on this next turn, which I guess Mudsdale did the did the best job it could, and it is setting up Tauros. Um, you know, Terranchar is pretty pretty strong, but you know, a, a wave crash from a uh, the water type Tauros might be able to knock it out. Um, and Dragapult is pretty frail, so Tauros does have a pretty reasonable chance of a. Uh, cleaning up the game here. So we see Taurus come back in, and it goes for Aqua Jet, barely doing 60% to uh, Sylveon. Um, I'm not really sure what the play here was with Aqua Jet. Um, Taurus was faster than Sylveon, so that wasn't really a concern. Um, maybe this was like a choice locked, um, like a choice band Taurus, so he just wanted to go for the fastest water type move he had to guarantee he could outspeed Dragapult, but um, Dragon Ball does resist water, so maybe not the best choice here. And also, Choice Band Aqua Jet against Sylveon should be dealing quite a bit more damage than just 16%. Tauros hits pretty hard, um, especially with that water stab on Aqua Jet. So, I don't think this was actually a Choice Band. Maybe it was, I don't really have any way of telling. Um, yeah, the damage rolls are a little bit too close to uh, confirm for sure. But I feel like a different move here could have probably knocked out Sylveon. Because that Hyper Voice one hit KOs the Tauros, knocking it out. And uh, giving Jake one more win under his belt. So, you know, while this game wasn't uh, as down to the wire as some of the other ones have been uh, in this past past few weeks, it's uh, it was still fun to watch live. Um, especially chanting for that uh, Ice Beam Freeze. Um, 
I feel like with a few different plays, the game, uh, you know, it wasn't close enough for me to say conclusively anything, but I think Ben would have had a slightly better chance had he not gone for some of those predictions on some crucial turns, and just tried to go for his strong stab attack when he had the chance. Um, hopefully that's not how things worked out, but I definitely could have seen this going the other way, um, had a few decisions been made differently. Um, anyway, something else I'd like to point out, um, to any astute viewers who've been, uh, keeping track, um, Jake's team this game, all of his Pokémon are nicknamed a letter, or I guess Sylveon was punctuation. So we've got, um, H, I, E, and an exclamation point. Um, Tyrantron and Dragapult were never sent out, so we don't know what letters they have. So, whether this was some kind of joke or secret message, um, We'll never really know unless Jake uh, tells us what the names of his last two Pokemon are. But I do think that's pretty clever, and I'm, I'm curious to see what it was. So, um, hey, uh, maybe in the comments below you could place your bets on what you think the hidden message was. Uh, maybe Jake will reveal his secrets to us. Who knows? Um, speaking of Jake, I'm uh, getting a little unprofessional here, but someone's got to take this guy down. He's been winning too much, and I, I don't want to let the victories get to his head, you know? So, you know, who knows, maybe uh, Josh will be able to put him in his place next week. Um, we'll just have to see. Anyways, that's all, that's all I've got for you guys today. This has been Eric, the Big Fishmonger, and I'll see you all in the next episode of Draft Battle Breakdown.